Okay, um, our next speaker is Jeremy Straub, uh, delivering a paper uh, with co-author Ronald Marsh. Uh, the title of the talk is Differences Are Not So Great, High Altitude Balloon and Small Spacecraft Software Development. Alrighty, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is some work that we've been doing here at UND um, about, uh, I guess, kind of the combination of some of the stuff we've been doing with our ballooning program and our small sat program and some of the synergies we've seen between the two. Um, and basically, I guess to, to give you the, uh, the conclusion before the whole presentation, one of the things that's been the result of this is we, we've actually been approved recently for an NSF program uh, under the research experience with undergraduates. And we've taken this hybrid approach and made this a, a part of the program where we're going to actually have a 10-week uh, kind of intensive program for students here over the course of the next three summers that's going to involve a balloon launch at the halfway point and then actually going out to JPL to look at the spacecraft side of stuff at the end. So it's kind of the, uh, you know, kind of the double uh, crescendo type uh, approach to the program. So if you, I guess, listen to the rest of this in that context, and what I'm talking about today is kind of what we've seen is the synergies between using the balloon to teach people how to develop software for spacecraft and also using the balloon missions as a way to actually develop and test some of the software as well that's targeted at a spacecraft. All right, so as a little bit of an overview here, um, I'll give a brief introduction, talk a little bit about some background. Um, I'll talk about the uh, software development process for both HAB and orbital missions, and you'll see that they're very similar in that context. Um, I'll talk about three mission concepts, just kind of as case studies, which I'll then use to illustrate the similarities and differences with the two types of missions. Um, I'll talk about the HAB mission utility for testing orbital software. Um, then very briefly present a uh, framework for kind of analyzing whether the HAB mission is suitable or not. Talk a little bit about the prospective education benefits, and if I haven't completely run out of time by this point, conclude. Um, so I, I won't spend a ton of time on background here. I'm assuming a lot of this is kind of preaching to the choir, but. Um, you know, one of the things to keep in mind here, you know, in, in a world where we now have a high prevalence of UAVs, we have higher or uh, high altitude aircrafts like uh, Dave Deline spoke about uh, yesterday and, and a lot of other technologies is that the, the balloon still falls, um, serves a very nice or fills a very nice niche between kind of the, uh, you know, the UA, which may be a 20,000 foot, 30,000 foot kind of topping out vehicle. Yes, there are some higher ones, but they're kind of expensive. Um, and the satellite, which, you know, may be at a much higher 300-esque kilometer altitude. Um, and it's very cheap. So it's a way to kind of do something where you have a lot of different opportunities to, to launch something, test it, et cetera, before you go to the expense of the you know, thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars of just launching something into orbit. Um, and you know, obviously if you find out it doesn't work, then it's probably a little bit too late. Whereas if you do something on a balloon flight and find out it doesn't work, well, you know, it's not as bad and you can do it again the next week. You don't have to wait another, you know, six months for a new uh, rocket launch. So um, I guess to kind of keep going on here, there's obviously been a lot of work on balloons and education. Uh, that's probably why we named the conference the uh, Academic High Altitude Balloon Conference. Um, and, and so again, I won't spend a ton of time on this. Um, one of the things I've spoken about previously that's very relevant to this work, and I also won't spend a ton of time on that either, is a notion of actually um, integrating HABs into the curriculum and how you actually run a HAB mission. And in the paper that I gave in that context, I made the argument that they're very different mission design processes. So I'm kind of arguing against what I previously said here by arguing it's very similar. But I do that with a caveat in that this is only talking about for software development, where previously the previous paper actually talked about the mission in general, which is a very different design process. So. There are a wide variety of different software design processes that have been proposed, and they range from everything from what, what is perhaps the aptly named Big Bang approach, where you kind of hope everything works when you're done, um, and a lot of times it doesn't, hence the Big Bang. Um, or the waterfall approach, which is again a very similar model of getting everything to the, uh, you know, perhaps with some more incremental testing than the Big Bang approach. But getting to a point where basically you say, okay, this is done, this is ready to go out the door, and then you get into a maintenance cycle. Um, and I'm going to use the waterfall approach um, to talk about this today, uh, even though it's not one that a lot of people would advocate anymore. Um, and the reason I do that is because the HAB process, just like the space mission design process, because you have the mass and volume constraints, is inherently iterative. And it turns out when you make the waterfall process iterative, it's not really the waterfall process anymore, but it actually kind of works in that model because you're bringing some of the best practices from other software design models and kind of shoehorning the waterfall model into it or maybe shoehorning those practices into the waterfall model depending on how you want to look at it. So I'll get to that a little bit, a uh, few slides down the road. Um, actually, next slide. So looking at this here, you can see that um, your basic waterfall model here on the left begins with defining the requirements. Uh, you then do design work, obviously, to figure out what you're actually going to develop. 
You look at implementation work. Um, you then verify that somehow. Um, and th this is where the, you kind of hit the waterfall in the whole process is when you start actually testing it. And then once you've gone over the waterfall, you then get into a maintenance mode where hopefully everything works and you're just making little changes based upon user feedback, et cetera. When you start looking at this in the context of a orbital or a balloon mission where you may get this thing done and then realize, okay, well, I now have you know, 30 times the computing capabilities required that I can fit into my little box here, um, then you're going to obviously need to go back and iterate. And that's why in the other model that I've put on the right here, you can see that when you start getting down to the verification step, you may end up having to loop back up and start you know, even possibly changing your requirements because they're simply impacted. You can't do everything you want within the mass and volume constraints, which are obviously requirements themselves. So in this case, you may end up looping through this you know, five times, 10 times, maybe two times, just depending on how close you get the first time. And eventually, you get to a point where you say that you know, it's either completely succeeded or it's good enough, and you move into that maintenance or orbital operations mode where, yes, there may be some stuff that needs to actually be done, but it's no longer this kind of iterative, everything's up for grabs type, let's go through the entire model again process. So, to look a little bit more at the suitability of the HAB uh, as, as a test platform and a uh, learning platform for the orbital missions, I'm going to talk about uh, three different mission case studies here. And basically, the first is a short-term Earth sensing mission, um, then I'm going to talk about a longer-term imagery collection mission, and finally, a homeland security concept uh, to support an ongoing operation. So, the notion here with the short-term Earth sensing uh, mission is that there are a lot of different ways you can collect data, right? And on, on a uh, platform even as small as the uh, CubeSat-sized uh, box we have over there, you have a lot of collection capability. You know, if you put a camera on that and you're able to supply a power so that it's taking a picture, say, every second or maybe even multiple times per second, you can actually generate a ton of data. You can generate more data than you could probably ever actually transmit. And one of the things that I've spoken about before, and if you look at the paper, there are some references in there. You can read more about this. Um, but is actually using a model and tra transmitting discrepancies. So this mission is based upon that model-based architecture, and I won't talk a whole lot about the model-based architecture um, because it's really not that necessarily necessary to aid the understanding of it with the exception of the fact that it really plays with the communications model for the mission, which brings us to the next slide, where we start talking about the differences and similarities between the two. So, between the prospective HAB test mission and a planned orbital mission, there are a number of different differences. Obviously, there's differences in the sensing resolution. Um, maybe you can, uh, you know, changing your camera and lensing, make this closer. Maybe you don't want to. Um, there's obviously, a, in any case, a difference in the imaging area as well as the ground track. Uh, there's differences uh, in the craft motion as well as, obviously, a lot greater attitude change with a balloon mission where you're ascending you know, possibly leveling off for a period of time depending on the type of balloon, and then descending versus a spacecraft where you basically go up and hopefully stay in a pretty stable orbit for your entire mission. Uh, and then finally, you have differences in communication windows, and this communications window for the concept of a communications, um, you know, implicated mission is actually quite significant. However, depending on how you do this with the HAB, you may have a, a different communications challenge as you're gaining and losing communications while tracking it. So it's not certainly not the same challenge, but it may be something that's equally as interesting, and it may represent kind of a worst case, particularly for missions that are anticipated using ground stations all over the world where you have you know, amateur operators that are picking it up kind of on, on a uh, at-will basis where you don't really know if it goes over ground station 12, whether ground station 12 is going to be on or the guy that's running ground station 12 is going to actually bother to send you the data that comes down. Um, so in that regard, it may be very similar. Uh, similarities for this type of mission include the, potentially the hardware utilized. Um, you could you know, potentially fly something that is almost identical. You probably wouldn't want to fly solar panels, for example. Um, and that's what gets us into the second thing, which is the mission power cycle could be very similar to the extent that you're basically looking at the short duration HAB mission as one cycle of the uh, discharge of the, of the CubeSat or small spacecraft. Um, Looking then at a long-term uh, digital imagery collection mission, um, and th this, ba this can, uh, case study is basically based on what Planet Labs has proposed, a single uh, s um, spacecraft or um, balloon payload that would be part of the ha uh, Planet Labs constellation. And basically what they're trying to do is have a constellation of 28 small spacecraft, uh, probably more in the long term, to actually collect imagery of the whole Earth. Uh, and they say that it's going to be, quote, unmatched in its uh, breadth and fresh uh, freshness. 
And the notion here is obviously if you're going to put this type of constellation up, uh, particularly if you need to kind of launch them all at once or on some coordinated missions to actually get the, uh, you know, the orbits that you want and the coordination between the, uh, the orbits so that you have the constellation design that you want, being able to test this a few times on a HAB before you actually start deploying spacecraft into orbit, that then it's very difficult to match for the rest of your constellation would be very valuable. Um, then again, looking at the differences here, we obviously have, again, our difference in optical resolution and imaging area, uh, the difference in the spacecraft versus the HAB ground track, and the differences in the communications windows. Um, so it's very similar in that regard. Uh, the hardware utilized could be very similar. Um, obviously, the Planet Lab spacecraft are more expensive than what you might be looking at as your typical CubeSat, making it a much higher risk of loss as a balloon payload. So it may be that you want to look at something that's more of a software test platform that doesn't necessarily have the same exact hardware. Um, and again, the mission power cycle can be very similar, presuming that you're looking at the HAB as just one power discharge cycle of the orbital mission. Um, I guess looking at the, then the third case study here, which is this mission in support of Homeland Security Operations, and this one is actually quite interesting because this type of mission has actually been proposed both as a ballooning mission uh, for a tethered balloon as well as as an orbital mission. Um, and then finally, more recently, the uh, Office of Responsive Space is now talking about doing a mission like that as a launch on demand small spacecraft mission where you would actually have a ready launch capability that would take the spacecraft up and deploy it to theater hours perhaps after it was requested. And this is what's driving a lot of these very small launch technologies, uh, such as the work that interorbital systems, uh, Garvey spacecraft and others are actually doing right now, is being able to try to make this basically launch to orbit as needed and, and to orbit that's designed for particular theater of operations. Um, so in this case, Again, you have something where you're going to want to test it a lot. For something that's you know, mission critical like this, you're probably not going to only do you know, similar testing like you might get with a HAB. You're eventually going to want to do some orbital testing because at the end of the day, this may be put in a situation where you know, the balance of a war or you know, human lives are depending on this thing actually working the way it's supposed to. So that probably merits a much higher level of testing than simulated testing. But it's a very good way to kind of build up that confidence in the mission. And, um, you know, the notion here is that this system, even if it is launched on demand, is still going to operate for an extended period of time. It's not being launched for, you know, a single mission, a single measurement, et cetera. So in this case, you also need to test the longevity of the, space, of the software on the spacecraft as well. And this is where it gets a bit tricky when you're talking about a constrained length mission. How do you actually show that the software works over an extended period of time? Um, and so getting back into our, our di uh, differences and similarities here, we've moved one more thing up into the differences category. We obviously still have our optical resolution, ground track, communications, um, as well. Now we, we also have our power utilization as another difference because obviously for a longer duration mission, for a mission that has to actually work kind of on demand, the power management becomes much more interesting and something that needs to be tested uh, much more thoroughly. We also have a very significant difference in the length of operations without being able to actually restart the thing. Now, some spacecraft developers, and Tyvek is a perfect example of this, have actually built in a mechanism to their hardware bus that resets the thing every so often. And the notion here is that if you lose comms or something goes wrong, you know, you have a single event upset, et cetera, by resetting the power every so often, the thing will hopefully turn back on. Now, whether you can do that for something where you also need it to work basically whenever somebody wants to, you don't want somebody to say, oh, I need this picture, and oh, it's restarting now. All right, I'll give that up a few minutes. Um, so that, that may be something that helps. It may be something that's not vi um, viable here. But the power cycle as well as the, uh, the length of the mission are, uh, you know, are quite diff different in this case. Um, we could still do a single uh, HAB test uh, that uh, you know, is, again, one discharge cycle, basically. But that would be uh, potentially not as valuable in this context. So. Uh, I guess kind of to discuss this, the uh, HAB mission utility for testing orbital software, I think we've shown you know, that there are a lot of similarities, and there are obviously some, some very critical differences as well here. Um, and, and of course, the biggest benefit is kind of something we've talked about a lot, which is the HABs are very inexpensive ways of getting this stuff up in the air, being able to get data that looks an awful lot like orbital data. Um, but you lose things like the ground track. You lose things like you know, the extension or the duration of operations, et cetera. And um, you know, this is something where you really need to look at this on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. And 
you know, when you start looking particularly at the duration of operations, this is where this gets really tricky because now you have to combine, take some sort of hybrid testing method where you're running it in some sort of simulation or lab environment to show that the software works viably over an extended period of time. But you also need to be able to show that it works well in the air, you know, at altitude or at least close to altitude that it's able to deal with that data. And you have other, you know, factors that kind of need to be thrown in there like what are you actually pointing at, attitude control, which you don't have. Um, as much of on the balloon and hopefully have a much better attitude control on the spacecraft where you don't have the uh, air kind of uh, getting in there and wreaking havoc sometimes. So there are some pretty significant differences here. And I guess the kind of the crux of this, uh, this presentation is looking at where these differences and how one assesses these differences. And that's where this, uh, this diagram comes in here of just kind of looking at all the different uh, areas um, and doing an assessment. And the notion here is that this is something where you can use kind of as a one-time you know, shot to say, is this a good idea or not? Or you can actually also use this to tune the mission. And looking at, again, the differences, costs, uh, similarities, aka benefits, for each of the five kind of critical areas here, uh, the spacecraft versus the HAB hardware, the ground track, the uh, resolution slash field of view aspect of it, added to control, and the operations component. And to see, uh, basically, how those, uh, those pan out. So another key uh, consideration here to kind of to wrap up quickly is the educational benefits. And this is another area where the HAB obviously shines because you can launch them quite quickly. And you're able then to, uh, you know, to get data and, and do it within something where you're not having to wait months or years for a launch where the student that actually wrote the code or helped build the payload in the case of the hardware can actually see that. And again, I'm obviously preaching to the choir here, so I won't spend a time, ton of time on that as well. Um, and I guess to conclude, you know, my, the takeaway from this is that there is a lot of value in the high altitude balloon platform for testing software, obviously both for the high altitude balloon platform, because, which is obviously then also a very you know, usable platform for that, but also for the spacecraft platform as well. And uh, you know, there are also obviously some critical differences that I've talked about that you know, need to be considered in designing the test plan. So I guess with that, I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Oh, sorry. Can you comment? You talked about the design process, but obviously you're going to want to reuse the software quite a bit. And to get into the maintenance phase, I mean, I know you're going to have different hardware every mission, but how would you reuse the previous software? Have you thought about that in their design? So, I mean, there, there are a few different aspects to that. I mean, the first is, that hopefully you're building kind of a legacy by doing this and that the software that you're using for the balloon test missions can become at least a, you know, a close replica or I guess perhaps in an order of operations perspective here, the software on the, the spacecraft can be a close replica of this so that you're able to take advantage of the heritage and the legacy of actually testing the software on the balloon. And you know, whether you're doing a series of balloon missions and then you know, making changes to the software to support each mission or you're able to use the software multiple times to collect data you know, for a scientific or other purpose and then be able to say, okay, well, I've tried this 50 times now and you know, around try 10, 12, 15, whatever, I got to the point where it just worked and it did my mission and now I can focus on the science and not have to keep playing with the software. And obviously there's gonna be some changes, tweaks, et cetera, to the software to support the spacecraft and you know, depending on what level of software you're talking about, if it's also interacting directly with the hardware, if it's not just mission management software, then you're obviously going to have some changes to make to support the hardware differences between the two payloads, uh, or the payload and the spacecraft, if that's the case as well. But the idea is to keep the software as similar as possible and to really only do you know, request or necessity driven changes so that you're building up this, this legacy and this, uh, this history of the software working and you know, also in trying to sell the orbital mission and going through the, you know, the TRL process or the uh, you know, validation process with your launch provider, um, having that capability to say, you know, this has actually been shown to work in all these different scenarios is something that can help them feel more comfortable that they're not launching something that's going to turn on halfway through the launch and you know, start deploying random stuff out of the spacecraft into little parts of their rocket that they don't want it in. So that legacy is definitely a good thing. Yep. So what about sharing between different groups? Um, you know, because if every group has to develop their own software, they're going to have different data formats and all this different stuff. So has there been any interaction with them? Sh sharing between different groups? There, there has and there hasn't. Um, right now, particularly in the small spacecraft space, there are a lot of different people that are making 
at least from a commercial perspective, very proprietary systems. Um, and these systems are, you know, the software is designed to work on their hardware. They've spent the money to develop it, so they don't really want it to be something that others can take and, you know, basically leapfrog them. Um, one of the things we're working on here is actually a framework uh, for developing a very low-cost CubeSat. And in that context, the software we make is something that anybody, they can use it with our design, they can use it with somebody else's design. You know, they can retool it and use it to fly in a UAV if they want to. You know, it's out there, it's going to be completely open source. And our hope is that that will be something that is able to be reused in that way. And there's also a process right now in the small satellite community of trying to discuss what standards we should adopt. Because in a way, it's kind of very much the wild, wild west. You know, there are lots of standards out there. You know, from a communications perspective, for example, CCSDS is a standard that has been widely used. And yet, every time you look at a CubeSat mission, it seems like somebody has figured out yet another way to either implement it partially, non-implemented, or to take some combination of it. And you know, some people are now using uh, APRS but they've decided to use like the transport layer of CCSDS. I mean, there's so many different kind of permutations of this that it makes it, like you mentioned, very difficult for interop. And, you know, that's something that probably needs to be, if not fixed, because, I mean, you're always going to have some variation, at least making it easier for people to get in. And certainly, you know, if people want to track and have, be able to use the collaborative networks, they need to be using systems and standards that those collaborative networks support. But that still doesn't drive it to the same level where you're getting to, you know, necessarily software having to be the same, just a communications format, maybe a data format as well. And even getting on that, to that, a lot of people are using the high level or the low level transport pro, uh, protocol and getting a high level compatibility and then sending down their own data in a proprietary format. So you have the ham operator who gets this packet and is all excited that they're going to get to look at a pretty image or something and then realizes that they have to send it in and wait two weeks for somebody to look at it, decode it, and then send it back to them because the, uh, the actual spacecraft developer didn't make it an interoperable format or didn't make their format publicly available, et cetera. That, I guess, any additional questions, or have I completely run out of time here?